Previously on Meriwether Lewis Part 1. It's like when you play a video game, the map is cloudy. You gotta uncover the map. Welcome to Ranking 76, where we're ranking 76 heroes and villains of the American West. I'm Eric. I'm Matt. And we're in part two today of Lewis and Clark. I'd, I'd ask what you remember from last time, but I guess as recording, it was last night, wasn't it? So how much how much do you remember about old Mary Weather? The, the biggest, my biggest takeaway is Clark got screwed. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, he really didn't get. He really didn't get screwed. It took seven years for his men, the men, to even find out. I think he. You can actually use the term. He was officially screwed. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. In the expedition. In the expedition from the office that. of the president. <laughs> Not going to happen. <laughs> but I mean, come on. Why would Lewis lie like that? I don't think Lewis was lying. I think Lewis fully thought he was a commander. And then he, then Jefferson was like, meh, I don't care. <laughs> Give him a lieutenant ship. What do I care? Right. But it's weird, though. It's weird, though, because they said he will still pay you like a captain. Uh, yeah. Was that it? I got to look at my notes. Yeah, remember? Yeah, remember? Because I was like, wait, I because I, remember I said I would have I would have done that. Less responsibility, still same pay. Well, he got the same amount of land. I think he got a lieutenant's pay, though. Hey, tell you what, it's just on the same screen, just a couple hundred words up. Um, I was almost. What was the name of that boat? What was the name of the boat they uh, that he built called? The keel boat. Yeah, I'm never, never gonna get into one of those bad boys. <laughs> See this long pole, boys? Start walking. <laughs> And metaphorically, this pole will do something else to you while you're walking up. <laughs> God, that would have been awful. And then what would have made it everything worse is to look over and see Lewis like drawing and writing in his notebook. Like, bro, <laughs> bro. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, for, what, for whatever it means, uh, Lewis, both captains were beloved. So by the men. Oh, so really? And can you imagine like, yeah, so it's going to suck initially. I can't even get out of bed without getting sore. Can you imagine the shape you would be in after journeying oh. across the Missouri River? But could you ever even get like, like rest? Like you're constantly doing work every day, all day, only to go ten miles. You could probably like some stretch. You could probably be like remember when we were right there last night. Yeah. <laughs> still see the smoke. Still see the smoke from the fire. <laughs> Hey guys, we've been we've been working hard real all day. Oh crap, I forgot my knife. Hey, I'll be right back. I'm just gonna go literally <laughs> run back and be it. Be back in right. an hour. <laughs> Cause I mean yeah, shoot, you can be- walk like a mile in twenty minutes. So I mean, shoot, you're looking at three miles an hour. Dude, you could do it in three hours. You could be back before sun up. <laughs> do you ever do you ever uh this hasn't happened to me, but whenever you see in the in a TV show where like the wife or the girlfriend or the angry partner gets out of the car and they start walking beside it, like triumphantly. I feel like there was, there had been a lot of that of them just walking around. The right. Shoulder. They would have been like, I'm not helping anymore. Get back in the boat, Johnny. Come on. All right. Do you remember where we left off yesterday? Yeah, we left on a very somber note. Um, George Floyd died <laughs> due to appendicitis. I don't think we can take that second take out now. I think you just, I found it myself for whatever reason. I keep calling him Charles Floyd. It's George Floyd. You know, it's Floyd. Just, I don't care. He doesn't have a first name anymore. Dead Floyd. That's who he is. Doesn't matter. He's in Sioux City, everyone. Go visit him. What a silly thing to get hung up on. <laughs> I know. All right. We soldier on. We're now entering Indian territory. 
We've already met a few tribes, but now we're really hitting it. They're still heading up to modern day Bismarck, correct? That is the end goal. They're trying to get to the Mandans. Mandans, yes. So the expedition has a few more things that they need to worry about. Uh, particular, natives like to keep raiding their horses, and it's only going to get worse from at this point out. We've already talked in Crazy Horses episode and Sitting Bull and all of them. Uh, the Sioux like themselves a raid, don't they? Well, that doesn't change just because it's 70 years before that. They also use horses as currency, too, correct? Yep. And the expedition has a few that they can take, and they're silly enough not to watch them. They're going to be gone. The Sioux have a reputation for being a powerful tribe that is hostile towards anyone. Out of any other tribe, Jefferson needed the Sioux to cooperate more than the others because they controlled basically the Missouri River for most of South Dakota. And we're really talking about near modern day Pierce, South Dakota, where there's a big bend in the river. They can control that. If you can control a part of that river, there's, well, pretty hard to keep trading uh, from the north, from the Mandans and getting them down to St. Louis. It really is a key tribe to get into. But as we've talked before, there's multiple bands of the Sioux. So good luck, Lewis and Clark. I'm trying to make all of them happy at once. They have a chest full of trinkets, though. They do so many trinkets, trinkets and beads. Give them a comb. Give them a comb. <laughs> How about a musket? What? What's a musket? I don't know what that is. <laughs> we have a cannon. Does that work? What about gun? What about gunpowder? Nah, that barrel's empty. That no, barrel's empty. No, okay. don't worry about it. Sir, it's leaking. It's leaking gunpowder. We can literally see it it's overflowing. <laughs> So, as they get into modern-day South Dakota, they see the Yankton Sioux tribe, or what that's going to end up being the Yankton Sioux tribe, and they signal by starting a small grass fire, which means that they want to start a conference. When they meet, Lewis takes this opportunity to give the name's chief and giving them a uniform and an American flag. Basically, kind of already make naming someone a chief. We're already starting that. Wonderful. Uh, they're they're deciding who the chief is. Uh ceremoniously, but yeah. Yeah, they are. Uh, yep. Mm-hmm. God, oh, it's it's great to know we just no, we never learn. Ooh, but who chills. doesn't want to who doesn't want to follow the guy with a nice military <laughs> coat? You there. Welcome, Chief. <laughs> <laughs> Now, obviously, the title meant nothing to the Sioux, who more or less just brush it off, and then the speech, and then the ceremony happens, and then they're just really worried about trading. Now, the Yankton Sioux are a little bit more welcoming than the the tribe that is further up north in the river, named the Teton Sioux. If you remember, I talked very, very briefly about the Teton Sioux in Sitting Bull's episode, because it's the same tribe. Sitting Bull is obviously about 30 years into the future but it's the same tribe still kind of being pushed west but that's kind of where they're settling the tetons are a lot more hostile than the yankton sioux so as the expedition travels further up north they get to modern day pierce south dakota where the sioux presence is pretty undeniable they start seeing them from a distance on their hunts john coulter was camping and even had his horses stolen. They run into some young boys who inform them that there are 80 lodges nearby and the captains ask those boys to go run and tell the chiefs that they will be there tomorrow and they would like a council. And then everyone probably started puffing their chest because this is the tribe they really need to impress. This is the Tetons. Hmm. The tone of this meeting is a little bit different than the ones before. The captains uh, supposedly show no intimidation towards the Sioux, which um, I don't think the we're not afraid of you, bro, right off the boat is probably the <laughs> best to, best approach to them. But we'll see if it works for them. But however, the Sioux are also kind of giving that same back. The Sioux know that they control the area. They're the ones with the power. They have all of the leverage. 
with this increased tensions more than the previous meetings that the core of discovery has had the normal translator whose name is pierre cruzat uh, who was a french man and also half omaha he didn't speak the sioux language another translator that doesn't know a language to be fair there's a lot of languages and it's not like they could take this is the one they needed this is the one they needed though language i'm not gonna tell you you don't have a point but there are a lot of languages out there so they would kind of like also they would also use like a, a form assigned language so like you could you could get the general the gist of it so, so to speak, okay. you know, also kind of, you also kind of hope somebody also speaks a version of the language that you're trying to present right. and then you can do it that way. It had been successful up to this point. So that in itself isn't, but boy, would have been nice to have someone who could speak Sioux at this point. Whenever the communication was between the two party, it was just very basic. Lewis and Clark said that they were peaceful, but they would fight if they had to. And they would not speak to them any further until their horses were returned. <laughs> hey, you know, you, you, you took something from us. I see him in the background there. Go ahead and give him back. <laughs> mm-hmm. And which the Tetons probably looked at them like, there's like 80 of us and there's like 40 of you. Okay, sure. So needless to say, they didn't give them back. Uh, you know, there's kind of a standoff at this point. It's peaceful, but it's just on the brink. You can just sense somebody wants to punch something real bad. (laughs) As the expedition leaves. So again, the captains leave. They're not going to speak until they get their horses back to them. The captains go back to the keel boat and they just start building up the defenses. Just in case that air, that air gun pumping that baby all the way up. We're going all the full PSI on that thing. We're loading cannons. People are getting ready. Later, the chiefs end up coming to the keel boat and they're given whiskey as a trade good or as a make piece while Lewis performed the basic science experiments like learning how to set a fire with a magnifying glass, which I'm sure was very cool. <laughs> but a, a middle school science project mm, just kind of show at this point. When the captains decide that it was time for the chiefs to leave, they all but have to force them on the canoes. They had seven men escort them to the shore, including Clark, who's in the who's in the canoe, canoe leading them down. When they get to shore, when three Sioux warriors grab the tow line and refuse to let go. Yelling between each side and Sioux, and one chief says that he will not allow the expedition expedition to continue until this canoe unloads all of its trade goods. What? So now they're trying to play like uh, you shall not pass. Yes. Big full show. You you will not pass. You can all own- canoe. That's a lot of goods. Yes, it was. A price that the expedition wouldn't be able to pay. Uh, well, they could pay it. But they're not because they have to kind of set. They have to like space these things out. Also, you can't just give it. They got a long journey. They sure do. They haven't even started. Oh, uh, they're a ways up there. But yes, they definitely have. They're not even at the the point of the they're map. Not they're not in uncharted territory. Yes. Right. Clark is normally the level-headed one of the two. He even reaches for his sword. Someone on the swivel guns on the keel boat starts getting that ready. The cannon is prepared and the two and the men have their light rifles loaded. Just when it looks like a fight is about to happen, a chief named Black Buffalo grabs the tow line away from the warriors and he asks the warriors to let go of the tow line and the Sioux will return and the Sioux return to the shore. If it wasn't for Black Buffalo, likely there would have been a fight. Blood One, would have been shed. Which the core of discovery... Probably wouldn't have won. (laughs) The Sioux hold a small conference when you know that the deliberations, one of those options was, why don't we just kill them all and take everything? But cooler heads do prevail. 
and the Tetons come up to the expedition and say, why don't you just stay here for the night and allow the women and children to come see the keelboat? And the captains are kind of, they don't want to say yes, but they kind of have to. Yeah, so you were just trying to, we almost just got into a bloody battle. Sure, we'll stay with you. (laughs) Yep. Yep. Uh, There really isn't much they can do, though. I would be nervous. I would be so nervous they were going to kill me in my sleep. Can you, this is where every story we talk about where the tensions get this high, this is where we say, and then a single gunshot was fired. And that's when everything happened. Like, we're at that point. And luckily, that gunshot hasn't happened. All right. As I said, the Sioux allow the expedition to stay, but the expedition has to stay for a couple of days so that the women and children can can see the keelboat. While there's no violence, you best know everyone was on their toes. And for the next two days, yes, two days, the expedition just sits there. Everyone just eyeing each other. Despite nearly coming into a fight, the core discovery is allowed to leave two days later under the supervision of about 200 warriors with their bows in arms. Then Black Buffalo, who just couldn't help himself, asked for just a small amount of tobacco, and then he grabs the rope of the canoe again. The patience of the two captains was out, and they refuse initially, thinking that this sets a precedent that the Sioux will continuously ask for gifts until the expedition is essentially broke. Even though they refuse, Lewis basically just throws a small scrap of tobacco and throws it onto the bank, saying, quote, saying that the chief, you have told us that you are a great man, have influence. Take this tobacco and show your influence by taking the rope away from your men's arms and letting go without coming to hostilities. Clark then, using a taping fire uh, to level his gun as he moves towards it. Only then did Black Buffalo allow the the captains of the expedition allowed to continue. It took Clark raising his gun before they actually let go of the rope again. He would have been the first one dead, Blackfoot. Or Black. What was it? Black. Black Buffalo. Buffalo. Yeah. The next couple days, the expedition tries to get the heck out of territory as fast as they can. And as it turns into October, the expedition meet the Arikaras and perform the usual ceremony that they move past into the North Dakota border. By October 20th, 1804, Cruzat runs into their first grizzly bear. Ooh. Now, now the expedition had heard about grizzly bears before and knew that the natives were afraid of it. Clark had recently seen a footprint and thought it was the biggest footprint he had ever seen. Being young men, the expedition are eager to see a bear and and to kill one, and one day when they do see them, they take a shot, and Lewis says, quote, We wounded him, but being alarmed at the formidable appearance of the bear, He left a tomahawk and his gun. (laughs) So whoever took a shot at him in the party took one shot. And you know what? This isn't worth it. He's going to kill me. Uh, Never mind. (laughs) These are also very different bears from the ones they're used to in Virginia. Like a black bear. Black bears, I mean, they don't really come after you. A grizzly will just attack you if it it pleases. Oh, yeah. there's nothing you can do about it. And they're huge. They have the attitude of a of a chihuahua is what is what grizzly bears have. <laughs> now, grizzly bears aside, that same month they finally arrive at the Mandan villages. Yay! Woo. They get to the place where they intend to stay during the winter before going out to the Pacific Ocean the next spring. They meet a chief named Big White who accompanies them to the village. They choose the Mandan villages because it is a trading post that was used by both the French and the British. This was an opportunity for Lewis and Clark to tell the traders that this is now United States territory and they weren't going to tell them that they had to leave, but they made it very clear that more Americans would be coming up from the river. A deal was made for the expedition to stay the winter and that they would take off during the next spring and the Mandans agree to let the expedition stay across the other side of the river. A fort is quickly built, and the men begin preparing for travel the next spring. 
Lewis, probably being the only trained doctor, probably for a thousand miles, kind of becomes the default go to for anything uh, medical, including in February, he has to amputate a boy's toes after they were frostbitten. From the Mandan or? From the Mandan, yes. So he became just like the village doctor. Yes. It was it was everyone involved. Now, this this is a genuine like partnership. Even when they first show up, there's this agreement of the Mandans basically tell them, you're allowed to stay, but when we are fed, you will be fed. But when we starve, you will also starve. There's not going to be any of this, you know, you your food, our food. It's you're in, in for a penny and for a pound with us. And generally, it was a pretty nice winter. Despite that winter came really early and well, for two Virginian captains was incredibly bitter by November, the river already freezes over and the keel boat is stuck in the ice. Oh man. Yeah. She's not going anywhere. Beep boop. Like that bad boy. up. No, she's locked in there. Uh, they won't be able to get that thing out until February. Now the keel boat, won't actually be continuing the journey. The Cuba was to get to the Mandans and then to basically take the the journals and the discoveries and take that back. That's why they had 40 something men up there. About a dozen are going to take the keel boat back with the current this time. So no long sticks required for the most oh, part. Oh, right. They can just coast. Yes. So, so about a dozen of them were only slated to go to the Mandans. Wait the yep. winter, come back. Yep. Gotcha. And then leave. A lot of what the captains are doing at this point, we're going to skip ahead just a little bit, but the priority for the captains is to make an initial report for Jefferson. Now, this report would total about 45,000 words. For context, these three episodes are about 16,000. So they were some big boys. They it was a thick, thick book. It also included map maps, illustrations, mineral samples, and even samples of all of the tribes language that they had going on. Including they met over 70 different tribes. They had 70 different samples of the tribes uh, language. Dang. Man, they yeah. were really getting, they were really they were really doing their job, huh? They I mean, I th- somebody summed it up the best. Uh, I think it was Dayton Duncan. It was they weren't only the first; they were the best. And even at the Mandan villages, sending all of this back is incredible. To have that much detail and and just subjects for Jefferson and anyone to uh, to uh, to review. So as the winter gets cold again, two captains, they're from Virginia. They're not used to when the weather gets, you know, below, let's say, 32. We'll just say freezing for them. So when one night when the winter gets to negative 38 degrees Fahrenheit, they're really not loving life at this point. There's not much going outside anymore because going outside will literally kill you. When there wasn't a threat of your life to simply go outside, the men drilled and then went on buffalo hunts and then would attend dances held by the Mandans. But when the buffalo were not around for a couple of weeks, the men are invited to a buffalo dance. Even if the men weren't excited to see the dance before, they were real excited any time a buffalo dance got uh, brought up again and they were invited because, according to the journals, Quote, from January 3 to 5, the Mandans held a nightly dance of their own. They invited the garrison to join them. When the men arrived, they had ushered to the back of the communal earth lodge. The dance began, and the music rattles with drums. Old men of the village, dressed in their finery, entered the lodge, gathered in a circle, sat down, and waited. Soon, the young men and their wives would fill in the lodge and then they would take their place to the back of the circle. They fixed pipes out for the old men, who smoked the ceremony ensued. 
As the drum beats became more insistent and the chanting swelled, one of the youngsters would approach an old man and beg him to take his wife, who <laughs> he would turn to her. She would appear naked before the elder, and he would lead them by the hand, as Clark would describe, quote, the girl would then take the old man, who often could scarcely walk, and lead him into a convenient place for the business, after which they would return to the lodge. So the old men are getting lucky. <laughs> <laughs> the thought was, the belief was, that the experience of the of the old man and his hunting ability would be sexually translated from the wife from the old man to the uh, wife and then to the husband makes sense and to the luck of the expedition they believed the americans were great hunters <laughs> oh no <laughs> are you serious <laughs> By the end of the winter, the men were complaining of venereal diseases. I don't understand how that could possibly happen. Now, if you ask me, I think one old, one dirty old man really, really thought well on his toes one day, and that's how this ceremony really started. Right. <laughs> and the Americans were just like, yeah, we're great hunters. Of course we are. Yeah, look how good we are. Like, they're finding anything. They're running 50 miles to catch a, a rabbit like. right well so then so you said uh a bunch of them got like diseases and stuff venereal diseases yes how many uh, i wonder how many had kids i don't think we know that but probably more than a few they had better be good hunters though right he lied to me <laughs> but there's a lot of that going on so yeah, so all of this was just so that the buffalo would come back. Two days later, the buffalo showed back up. Oh, jeez. Now, I don't know if I was the man if I would be really disappointed, but I don't think they were too happy to see the buffalo. Ah. Kind of <laughs> you can see them like trying to like nobody look over there. They're trying to cover them up like shoot, no buffalo. shoot. Shoot her down. <laughs> yeah. Go away. Go away. Go away. Yeah. They really, they really like that January of 1805. So the expedition outside of the Buffalo Dance had entered an area that wasn't in constant war, but there were at least tensions. Neighboring tribes in the Mandan would constantly be raiding each other, and Lewis offers himself up to be a pacemaker but has pretty mixed results. Toxic police do happen, but after generations worth of fighting, there isn't much headway that he can do in just a couple of months. At best, Lewis asks to end all raiding between the tribes, but that's not really effective because it's very entwined in just the culture. We're jumping the timeline a bit, but just weeks before the expedition is set to resume, they hear that the Teton Sioux are planning an attack on the Mandans specifically because the core of discovery was still there. Oh no. So this is like around March. They're about to leave. So it's not really Lewis and Clark's problem anymore, but that's just a nice little problem for the Mandans to have as, as their lead. During that winter, they run into a French Canadian fur trader named Troussant Charbonneau, which is just a really cool name. He is 45 years old and has worked with the North has worked for a Northwest company, but is now working as an independent trader living among and used to be living among the Hidatsa. He had with him two women that he called squaws or his wives that he had won on a bet from Hidatsa men. Both of them were teenagers. One was a snake or, and one was a Shoshone who themselves were taken from a Hadassah war party. One of them was a 15-year-old girl who was six months pregnant. Her name could be translated into bird woman, but we know her as Sacagawea. Sacagawea. Yeah. She, she was almost pregnant? She was six months pregnant and 15. Huh. I didn't realize she was pregnant. She was very, yes. Well, she won't be for long. She's six months, so right. give it give it a little bit. 
Charbonneau offered to be a translator for the expedition when it resumed, and the captains accepted and told him that they would only ta- that he could only take one of his wives, so he chooses that he's going to take Sacagawea. This would then complete the telephone, telegraph, tele-Frenchman translation that would end up that they would have to be using towards the Rockies. How it would work out was well, Sacagawea would speak the native language to Charbonneau, who would translate it into French for George Druyard, who would translate the French into English for Lewis and Clark to then hear. That's the system. So it's going through four people or three people, including a 16 year old, by the way. Right. I'm not going to tell you today. (laughs) No, I don't want to. He says you're a big stupid head. Wow, I can't believe they went through that much like trouble. And that was the uh, the quick route. Other than that, you just basically have to point at stuff and like kind of like, huh? Look at this, huh? No, not this. Okay, what about this? I don't know. Yeah, it was a long, convoluted system. We'll see if it works. That's a really weak cliffhanger, isn't it? It's real. <laughs> I wonder if it worked. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they all die. <laughs> As we get into February 1805, Sacagawea is ready to give birth. Now, this is Sacagawea's first child, and Louis Rodori, quote, this was the first child which of this woman had born, and it was common in such cases that her labor was tedious and her pain was violent. Lewis is really unsure what to do, so he consults with someone who tells him to administer a small portion of rattle from a rattlesnake. But having no idea if this is going to work, why not? Lewis doesn't have anything. Let's just see if this works. And then... As soon as he gives it to Sacagawea, he wrote in his journal, quote, While the medicine was truly the cause or not, I shall not undertake to determine. But she had not been taken it more than ten minutes before she brought forth. This remedy may be worthy of future experiments, but I must confess that I wanted faith as to its efficacy. The boy, she gives birth to a baby boy who they named Jean-Baptiste Charbonneau, and he would also be coming along on the expedition. Now they gotta deal with a baby. Yes, they do. Well, basically two babies, because Sacagawea is only 15. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, they not- lost one, gained three. Yep. A 45-year-old French tradesman, his wife who was stolen from her family five years before, and now a newborn child. Sheepers, creepers. After she gives birth, Charbonneau wants to now negotiate his contract. He understands how important Sacagawea is on the trip because the tribe she was taken from was a Western tribe. So she knows more about the area than probably anyone, despite her young age. So, of course, Charbonneau wants to dictate his own terms. The captain said that if he came, he would work with the other men on equal footing and he would stand guard on regular. Charbonneau replied, quote, let our situation be what it wills, and we will not agree to work or to stand guard. <laughs> if miffed with any man, he wished to return when he pleases, and then to have the disposal of the provisions of which he wished to carry. So, Charbonneau so basically, was, I'm going to work until I don't want to work anymore, but I'm not doing any extra duties. Yep. And they agreed to it, didn't they? No. No, they did not. Okay, good. As much as they needed Charbonneau, that wasn't going to fly. You just tell the men who just had to poke a river river bottom for the last thousand miles up to this point, and now he gets to just sit on the shore and do nothing? Eh Eh-eh. So the captains simply asked Charbonneau and his young family to kindly leave, and they would hire someone else. Keep in mind... They're in a French and British trading site, like intertwined. Charbonneau is not the only translator. Now, they really, really would like Sacagawea. They would tolerate Charbonneau, but they would really like the wife. That's who really that they're going for. 
after four days, Charbonneau comes back and effectively ap- effectively apologizes and asks the captains to reconsider. And after making him sweat it out for a bit, they both agree. Charbonneau and his family would now be coming back to the expedition. Hip hip. What a team member. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> you know, I've, I've done a fair amount of hiring in my day. And that's one of those hires where you're like, I'm going to regret this, but I really need you. You know, gonna... you're not going to tell them that you need them, though. Yep. I'm this could go very sour, but we're gonna, you, we you, he's no one of those choice. people you tell you say you're lucky I'm in a good mood. You can come back. But in your mind, you're thinking, <laughs> God, I need this guard. Son of a gun. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what it is. As it turns to April 7th, 1806, the men leave the keelboat behind and pack six canoes and two P-Rogues. P-Rogues, again, slightly larger canoes. I don't know why I feel like I need to explain that all the time, but that word confused the heck out of me for the longest time before I looked it up. So, <laughs> if anything, I'm just bragging. I know what a P-Rogue is. And just watch. I probably am pronouncing it wrong. But what else is new? Without having to haul the keelboat and its 10 tons of cargo, they hope to make an astonishing 20 miles a day. Oh, whoa, whoa. Slow down, Eric. Slow down. Slow down. We've now gone into speed walking. Maybe (laughs) maybe a slow jog. The Corps of Discovery had already passed a a grizzly by Pierre Curzat uh, just before they get to the Mandans. But that was just the first time they encountered the bear. Surely they're going to be better prepared now, right? Like that one was a fluke. Sure. Right. We have Kentucky <laughs> long rifles. I don't care what the natives said that this grizzly bear is probably something we should avoid. Uh, we're young. We're America. And we have our guns. By God, <laughs> nothing can outmatch us. Well, then they run into another the grizzly bear, and Lewis is walking along the shore when he spots two of them. Yay, yay, yay. Lucky for him. Now, the two men are standing on the uh are standing in a canoe and they fire and they hit the intended targets, one a piece. So one bit like each grizzly bear has one shot in them. One flees. However, the other one just starts charging at Lewis. Ah! Yes, panicked run is what exactly what's going to happen. Lewis runs for about 80 yards before the grizzly bear finally dies from its wounds. Upon examining, they realize that the 300-pound animal was only a young one. It wasn't Um, even full grown. I was going to say, man, they got that one pretty easy. (laughs) <laughs> oh, it only took 80 yards of him running at full speed to just die so that tells me mama bears somewhere real close multiple mama bears yeah oh, God. a week later clark runs into a grizzly and ruis wrote in his journal quote a most tremendous looking animal and extremely hard to kill notwithstanding he had five balls through his lungs and five others in various parts He swam more than half the distance across the river to a sandbar where it was at least 20 minutes before he died. He had the most tremendous roaring from the moment he was shot. The bear was so big, they didn't have an instrument to weigh it. (laughs) A week later, they find another grizzly bear, and Lewis writes, after killing that one, I find the curiosity of our party is pretty well satisfied in respects to this animal. (laughs) AKA, please (laughs) (laughs) never come back. They're so scary. Run for your lives. No, my question is, did they like when they killed the bears, did they just leave it or did they like cut it up and take the meat and stuff? Oh, use that meat because they're still, they're still eating a tremendous amount of meat. We talked about nine pounds of of Buffalo on the plains. There's, I mean, 12 of them went away with the, with the keel boat, but there's still 30 of them and they're still burning a lot of calories. Right. Oh yeah. 100%. This is the part of the expedition where the goal is to find this great waterfall that they had heard about all winter. 
After that, they could then follow the Missouri River to its source. And from that source, they could simply pick up their canoes from the Missouri River, place it on the waters that will be the Northwest Passage, and then they would finally have the current in their favor. That's what this season is about. Follow the Missouri to its source, pick up the canoes across the Continental Divide, place it in the Northwest Passage, and then go amongst your way. Very easy goal. Let's do this. We can do it. Until then, they still have quite a bit of river before they get there. In May, they are traveling along when Lewis is walking on the shore, and Charbonneau and Sacagawea, along other men, are in the two big pirogues. Then a sudden gust of wind surprises Charbonneau, who in a panic turns the bow, the bow into the wind. The wind was strong enough to take the sail out of the man who was attending it. The captains were firing their rifles in order to get the attention of the crew, who they now believe the boat is about to turn over. And by the way, on this boat are the journals. Oh, no. All their work. All of those words, everything from the Mandan villages is on here, plus scientific equipment, things you will not be able to recover. Pierre Crozat, described to be the best waterman in the expedition, was shouting instructions to Charbonneau, but Charbonneau couldn't hear because according to Stephen Ambrose, he was because Charbonneau was, quote, was crying for God for mercy and he could not hear. So Charbonneau, <laughs> Charbonneau is in a complete panic. Absolutely not, not helpful at this point. What a turd. <laughs> the boat is taking on water and items are starting to float away. Lewis is at the shore, but he's about 300 yards away. Like, he's at the point where he's starting to take off clothes and he's about to dive in to reclaim it. But uh, there's not much he can do, honestly. Cruzat finally gets to Charbonneau to listen by literally to threaten to kill him if he doesn't start following his instructions. Where finally Charbonneau turns the rudder into the wind and the ship corrects itself. Enough for Charbonneau to at least steer it into the shore. The boat, I guess, was more sunk than it was above water. How many journals got destroyed? None, because Sacagawea was said to have been calm during the entire time and saved the journals. And everything that was floating right. over, she brought it back in. If Again, I can always keep bringing this up. If the 16-year-old new mother wasn't on this expedition... <laughs> They would have been lost. Now, we should probably also mention that we're gonna we're gonna talk about this more in Sacagawea's episode. But uh, this is this may have been the second time this has happened in a couple months that she saved or remained calm in a dire situation uh, where Charbonneau almost sunk a boat. That guy sounds like an idiot. <laughs> you know, Lewis agrees with you. Lewis did not have kind things to say. In fact, after after the expedition's over, um, in his journals, now keep in mind, he's a Virginia gentleman, right? Even his worst enemy, he's going to say something, something nice. Maybe a little catty, but something nice. He described Charbonneau as a man of, quote, no particular merit. Do you remember the movie? Almost Heroes. I know we've talked about it. Yep, sure do. Do you, do you remember Eugene Levy's character? He was his character, wasn't he? Yeah, he was true. He was the one married to the Native American gal. Yes. You remember how she was the calm, like, mannered one, and he was... The oh, leader? yeah, and he was the... Yep, I remember that. Yep. <laughs> you know, for being a comedy that has that could care less about historical accuracy and they get a lot of things right <laughs> to where you just get true Saint Charbonneau is, is Eugene Levy's character where well, you do not look at this woman at all. <laughs> oh, that's a terrible impression, but I like it. How dare you? <laughs> this is a good French accent. How dare you? Isn't he, in the movie though, isn't he the one that gets like, is constantly getting injured? No, that's Bidwell. 
Bidwell gets his ear bit off. <laughs> and then he's talking. Where, Bidwell, where are you? Where are you? I can hear you. I can. Yeah, he's five feet away. <laughs> Gosh, what a terrible movie, but I like it. I'd love that movie. I don't care. You know what we should do? Uh, we should do a live reaction to that movie because it's it's very I it's not funny, but boy, I love it. I'd love that movie so much. I love Chris Farley. OK, so after everything is dried off, the journals are saved. There's a little bit of good news because now they can see the Rocky Mountains like an incredible distance off, but they can see them. So, hey, that's a start. You got to start to see the Rocky Mountains before you can cross them. Right. While the travel has never been particularly easy, the train does start to become more of a hindrance. There are just a couple hundred miles away from Fort Mandan when the area becomes more rocky. Moccasins are not lasting as long as they used to, and they're having a harder time sleeping from the pain on their feet. But also, this isn't necessarily uh, this area's issue. But keep in mind, if you're going to go essentially camping for a year and a half near riverbanks, what are you going to run into? Rocks. Rocks and a particular flying bug. That's incredibly annoying. Nat? Mosquitoes. Mosquitoes. Now, they're always in the background. And I don't really, other than this part, probably won't talk about them again. But they are a burr in their saddle the entire time. They're just getting ate up, tore up. With no bug spray, really no protection from them. But yes, Oh, that would be miserable. I'm itching just thinking about it. Yeah, it's not not fun. And then when you think your feet are also hurting, like it's it's not the best. You have to be irritable. I mean, your feet hurt. You're just getting I mean, I I did. uh, I was in Minnesota and we were out in the woods and like I had bug spray on. But when I tell you I was covered in mosquitoes, it got to the so point where I was so irritated. I literally just washed my arm with like 15 mosquitoes on there, just sucking away going, yeah, I bet you like it. You sons of gun. <laughs> <laughs> you were bad mouthing mosquitoes. Like I remember seeing them on like my glasses and I was just like, oh my gosh, this is the worst. So you can imagine without bug spray. <gasps> oh man. Oh, real miserable. Also, uh, no sunscreen. Not that that really matters, but they're in the sun an awful lot. When we All say day, they're every day, oh, yeah, all day, every day. When you're in the plains, uh, there's quite literally no trees. So yeah, they're they're well tanned. They're Greek gods from pushing the boat down, and but they're they're very itchy. They're not comfortable <laughs> at all. I didn't write it in here, but sometime soon here, um. They're also going to run out of whiskey and they're going to run out of rum. Oh, no. So now all their like fun free time is gone. But the the captains do allow them. Again, I didn't put this in the notes. So this is kind of about the top of the dome. But the captains kind of let them have like, you know what? We have like two days of rations. Guys, let's just go. Let's just party. <laughs> let's just finish it out. Yeah, let's just finish off what's left. Let's do this here. Um and this is where Stephen Ambrose liked to also point out uh, that it was Napoleon's thing where you would bring your you would make sure you had enough rum to get out where far enough to where men couldn't desert. And that's that's pretty much where they're at right now. It doesn't matter how far like if what rations they have, if they go out by themselves, um, they're not coming back. Yeah, their chances of survival are pretty much nil at this point because they're quite literally off of the map. On June 1st, 1805, in north-central Montana, the Corps of Discovery come into an unexpected fork in the river. One branch flows north, and the other flows south. Now, they're surprised because they've heard about these great falls from the Mandans and the Hadatsas and everyone that was at Man- Fort Mandan, but they never mention this fork, probably because the natives never had to use the river. Now, it's Jefferson's instructions to follow the Missouri to its source. But the Mandans can just go across the prairie. (laughs) Right. So it never dawned on them, or they might not have even known about this fork. Now, there's a debate. They're literally staring at it, not knowing what to do. 
the fork to the north. Go ahead. Uh, no, no, I was just going to say, I think I know what's going to happen. I, I, I vaguely remember this. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. Tell, tell us. Correct me if I'm wrong, which I'm probably wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but they can't decide which path to take, so they split up. Clark goes one way, Lewis goes the other. You are right? close. I know what you're uh, talking about. That's not for a little bit, but you're very close. Oh, okay. Here. There's three I times. Remember, I remember them, and then they like eventually like meet up again, don't they? Oh, you're so good. I'm so proud of you right now. <laughs> this is great. I'm so happy. Uh, so you're mixing that up with a couple. With You're mixing up basically three different stories. So oh, okay. this one, um, you're right. But in this particular instance, the the fork to the north is like muddy, muddy river, which is what the Missouri has been since they've been on it. So the men believe they're on like the north road. The north fork is the way to go because this is what we've seen because it's just what we saw behind. The two captains are looking at the south fork like this can't be. Because eventually we're going to have to run to the source, which likely comes from a mountain. And because it doesn't have that runoff time where those minerals can collect and deposit and like go up into the mud. We think this clear way is the way to go. Oh, right. Because that's where that that's closer to where like the mountains are. Yep. Or like the mountains would be shooting out the, the fresh yep. water. Wherever the source is, the source doesn't have time to deposit all of the like the, the mud and the dirt and all of that. Right. So they're convinced this way, but, and the captains, they absolutely could have just said, we're taking the South Fork because we think we know what's best, but they put it up to a vote. And the North Trail wins. They do follow the North Trail. They do, but they kind of have an agreement of, we're going to follow this for 40 miles and we're going to see where it goes. And if we don't, if we are not convinced this is the Missouri River, we're going to head back. So they, they listen to their men and they go, okay. which is so a they, lot they, more. They basically compromised. Yeah. Which is a lot more than I think a lot of military commanders would do because I, I don't know this, but Matt. 100%. <laughs> it is. Um, this is how we're going to do it. So they follow up this north route. And after 40 miles, the captains have enough to know that they think that this is just going into somewhere into Canada because they know Canada is there. Um, and also keep in mind, they can't get this decision wrong. It's already June, which means it's quite literally half of the year is over. They need to get over those mountains before the end of the year. They just need to. So if they get this wrong with the men who we won't say miserable, but they're getting a bit cranky. If they get this wrong, the entire season is wiped out. Who's to say if they have to go back to Fort Mandan, if this expedition isn't over. Right. Because they can, they will just abandon at that point. If, if they, if they're not a hundred percent bought in. So the captains have them go back. So they went the 40 miles, said nope and turned around. Yep. They, it was, they were convinced enough that they thought that would go to Canada and they said, okay guys, we're going to go take the Southern route. Actually, if I remember it, right, I think they said, now we're going to go to the Southern route and now we're going to go up that 40 miles and we're, we're going to see what happens there. But yes, they do. They do explore both both sides but it's not like they had yeah so they didn't have unlimited time so they had to right so i mean were they making 20 uh, miles a day yeah yeah so it oh, was so a two day so it was only a two day uh yeah. four day total yeah error and i wouldn't say error but experiment compromise. yeah experiment yeah now unfortunately the walk back is miserable <laughs> it's raining constantly they're barely able to sleep at night because they're just so wet the land is slippery and it's also getting more mountainous as we said before but now they're starting to walk on some clay that lewis described as precisely like walking over a frozen ground which thought upon a small depth and slips equally as bad lewis himself falls on a pass on a narrow walkway that if he would have fallen off, it was a 90 foot drop. So he died, would have died. Instantly. He would have been done. The official captain 
of the expedition. Right. <laughs> I'm the captain now. So as Lewis is recovering from his fall and probably probably full of heavy breath, right? He, he almost died. He then hears Private Windsor call out, God, God, Captain, what shall I do? Windsor himself had slipped and was holding on with one arm and one leg off of a ledge. Oh, my God. Uh. <laughs> Lewis, quote, for I expected every instant to see him lose strength and slipped off. Lewis called for Windsor and advised him to take a knife and to dig a hole in the bluff where he could stick a foot off that he was hanging in so he could have a foothold. <laughs> Quick, Windsor... dig into the mountain. <laughs> 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 I know you can't hold on, but dig, man, dig. <laughs> if this was Charbonneau, he would probably just be in a high-pitched shriek right now. So at least Windsor is, is listening, and he's able to do so. Lewis then told him to take off his moccasins and crawl forward on his hands and feet, and he is able to crawl up the bluff safely. <sighs> Dang, that would be so nerve-wracking. I mean, for everyone. Like, you're yes. literally watching a dude that might die. I'm afraid of heights. Uh, F this situation in every possible way. <laughs> There's no... Yep. You know, I'd just quit. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna sit here and die. Let a group I, just, get me. I would stand up and go, nope. Mm-mm, I'm out. You know? It's been fun, guys, but uh this this isn't for me. <laughs> Can I put in my two weeks? Now we're at the part of the expedition where it's starting to get late early. Remember that in the Donner's party episode, how important it was to get past the Sierra Nevadas before win before winterfall. And they are getting close. They are getting close. It's they're in June, but the difference between the Donners and Lewis and Clark is Lewis and Clark is quite literally making the map. Right. So, I mean, they could have easily messed up in, uh, like yeah. anywhere. Well, they don't know where they're going. They know they're following right. the Missouri, but they don't know every bend. Everything they do is new to them. So, Yeah. They're starting to get that bug in their ear, too, of like, when do we get there? They see the Rockies. They've seen the Rockies for a while, but they're just so far off. And they're starting to think, like, how big is that mountain range? Because we're not right. getting much closer. <laughs> they're still expecting mountain ranges like the ones they saw in Virginia. Like, that would take three days to pass. That's the mountain ranges they're expecting to see. And now that bug in their ear is starting to think. If we see the mountains this far away, like how big are these? Yes. But again, after they find the, after they get past the Rockies, they just need to get across the continental divide and then they can just find the Northwest passage and then they're on water again. So then they can, but when they're on the water again, it's going to be with the current. So then they can really whip through some miles. So like there's some optimism. It's not doom and gloom. There's a plan here. They just need to get to the falls because that's the first step this season. So in order to expedite that, Lewis volunteers to take a small party and to go advance scout. Now, the men are still skeptical that the South Bend is the correct Missouri. But Lewis kind of uses this as another chance of a compromise that I'm going to go ahead and I'm not going to return unless I see the Great Falls. So if you do not see me, you assume I find the Great Falls. You're going to keep coming. But if you see me returning back, it's not going to happen. So everyone wanted to not see him. <laughs> yes. You didn't want to see Captain Lewis because <laughs> you just lost some of the some of the season. Luckily for Lewis, he comes up to the Great Falls pretty quickly and he couldn't be happier. Now, they're expecting to find a half day portage across this falls. But the chapter one, it's done. It's great. We're here. We're back on schedule. Lewis then approaches the first waterfall, and that has a 50-foot drop. Okay. It's not bad. Okay. We've seen 50-foot water drops before. He then follows the river for five miles of continuous rapids. When he crosses the bend, and he sees another waterfall, and then he sees there's a 20-foot drop. Okay. Well, they said this was a great falls. This is the great part of it. Okay. We've done this. We can do this. He even described these two waterfalls as uh, the second waterfall as pleasingly beautiful. And while the other was sublimely grand, he's liking the sight of these. He then continues and then says, 
another waterfall of 14 feet, and then a fourth one of 26 feet, and then a fifth one. Oh, dear. (laughs) A total of 12 miles. And the Mandans strongly suggested that there would only be one, possibly two. And there's five. This half-day portage isn't going to happen anymore. Crud. Still excited that they're still on track, Lewis continues up farther and finds what he believes to be the largest buffalo herd he had ever seen. He plans a hunt, and he heads back and kills a buffalo. But as he's cleaning the animal, he doesn't realize that guess what's behind him? The rest of the herd? No. A grizzly. Another grizzly bear is creeping up behind him. Oh, no. Lewis is pretty much by himself, cleaning a buffalo. As he sees the bear, he realizes that he just killed the buffalo, so his rifle isn't loaded. I would just run. The bear would easily take the buffalo. Lewis thinks the same thing, but the bear doesn't take the buffalo. Lewis, his best chance is he runs 80 yards. And he runs into a into a river with waist deep water, where he's very likely going to have to make a last stand. It's just how fast he's willing to go. Lewis prepares for battle, but is relieved that the bear just went up to the riverbank. And I feel like he just put his toe in. Is like, no, it's too cold. Uh, no, I'm not about this life. I'm just going to go head back. You win. <laughs> you win. That's it. Okay, bye. And Lewis. Standing in waist deep water, doesn't know what else to do with himself because he should be dead at this point. As the water's turning yellow. Yeah. <laughs> it was probably a good thing it was waist deep because we don't know what was just below that current. <laughs> this will be the last time Lewis will ever have his rifle unloaded for the rest of the expedition. <laughs> that lesson has been learned. Shocker. Now. Yeah. <laughs> he then heads back and starts uh starts to go to the falls and waits for Clark and the rest of the expedition to show up. And they do by the second week of June. But now there's a little bit more bad news because now Sacagawea is sick. <gasps> no. And, and she has been for almost a week. And what does Clark do with his very minimal uh medica- medical medical Give her the uh, lightning? He doesn't give her the lightning. It's the other method that they used on everyone. Take a guess. Um, Arsenic. They're going to they're going to bleed the heck out of her because that's all they knew what to do. (laughs) Are they going to get leeches or what? Nope. They're just going to cut open a vein and they're going to let it pour out. Are you serious? We're going to let. Yeah, they're going to bleed her. And they he bled her a lot. It sounds like. To the point where uh, it wasn't looking good for Sacagawea. In in fact, she was decided as, quote, the Indian woman was very bad and will take no medicine. So when Clark gets up to Lewis, they basically trade responsibilities. Clark, who is more of the wilderness man anyway, more of the frontiersman, uh, is going to figure out how to do the portage. And then Lewis is going to take care of Sacagawea, which he does. Uh, But for whatever reason, he blames Charbonneau on why she keeps getting sick. (laughs) So we don't know what Charbonneau was doing. But whatever it was, Lewis uh, didn't appreciate it. If I remember from another book, I believe the theory is he was catching him getting some berries for her that Lewis didn't want her to have. Uh, well, I mean, God, they don't know anything out there. They don't know what the... They're quite literally learning it. Spoilage is out there, yeah. So, Lewis uh, prescribes her a combination of bark and opium. (laughs) And I bet she did feel much better after the opium. (laughs) Here, have some opium. Uh, and, uh, this bark. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Sacagawea felt better within a couple hours with Lewis. 
Uh, she then asks for water, and they find a mineral spring shortly by, and she is given that. Within a couple of days, she's she's feeling much better. Largely to the mineral, the mineral source. She probably needed those minerals because Clark bled her so much. She needed like a little boost. <laughs> And ladies and gentlemen, that is where Ice Mountain Water is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dasani. <laughs> if they don't put Sacagawea on that label now, I just don't. I'm very disappointed. So now they need to get across. Sacagawea, thankfully, will continue. So now they, on June 22nd, they're going to finally begin this portage. And let me tell you, this portage is miserable. Moccasins weren't working well before, like they were running out faster. Well, now moccasins last two days. You would make a new pair day one. You would mend them that night and then you would mend you would mend them that night. And then the next day they would be completely cleared out. The soul would be done. It was that Jeez. rocky. Their feet are literally bleeding on the rocks. Keep in mind, they're also hauling all of their equipment across this 12 miles in very slippery, very wet, very miserable conditions. It's really hard to overstate how difficult this was during the portage. It's going to take them six weeks to cross the Great Falls. What? Yeah. A month and a half, huh? Month and a half. They thought it would be a half day. <laughs> Guys, we'll be done by dinner. Six weeks later. <laughs> so now they've made it past the Great Falls, but boy, they're getting behind. It's getting real late in the season, and those Rockies are still a ways away. Lewis would write in his journal, quote, the mountains are still the mountains, they still continue as high and seem to rise in places like an amphitheater, one rank above another until they recede from the river until the most distance and lofty their tops are clad with snow. It's July turning into August and there is snow on top of these mountains. They have got to be getting so scared. Yeah, there has to be just a constant anxiety in their stomachs at all times, like nervous anxiety. But they also have to be getting close to the Missouri River because it does keep getting shallower and less rapid. Now that they're out of the Great Falls, step two is to find the Shoshones. The Shoshones are the tribe Sacagawea was taken from when she was young. So this is her home tribe. And this is what she is here for. Do you think they're worried? Are they are they not worried? Like, hey, we're about to bring this gal that was taken back to her tribe. Aren't they going to be pissed? Uh, I'm sure someone had that thought. Well, you that's the scary part about this whole thing. They don't know anything. They don't know how tribes are going to react. They don't know the, the terrain. They literally know nothing. Yeah, I guess all the tribes could be, like, deadly. Yeah. Everyone hostile. Yeah. Now, the, keep in mind, they're getting information from the Mandans who are getting from the Hadassas. Like, you, they, the tribes know each other or at least heard of each other, so they have an idea. Like, just but in the way that they told the expedition about the Great Falls, where the, the expedition almost like with an arrogance looks at it like, yeah, I can do that in half a day. No problem. The mountain, the Rocky Mountains, yeah, we know about the ones out east. We're going to be just fine. It's that type of thing. So, yeah, as they come into the realization that things are just a bit bigger out here, yeah, there, there has to be some nerves, and they have to be real scared. But as they start looking for the Shoshone, it is decided that Clark will lead a scouting party before it leaves. And before he does leave, he has the forethought enough to ask Sacagawea, what the word is for white men or for friend. She replied, Tababon, Tababon. But 
Sacagawea was a little confused because the Shoshone didn't have a word for white man, and instead, she may have given Clark the word for stranger. Oh, no. <laughs> it might even be loosely translated into enemy. Yep, I figured. For whatever reason, Clark decides not to take Sacagawea, who would probably come in more handy than just a one-word translation that says stranger. But he leaves her with the expedition. Just as the expedition is reaching a new low in morale, Sacagawea gives them much-needed good news as she now starts recognizing landmarks from her youth. Lewis wrote, quote, the Indian woman recognized a point on a high plain to her right, which was informed us that was not very distant from a summer retreat of her nation river beyond the mountains, which run to the east. She's starting to recognize things. This is good. Yeah. Finally, this is good. So Clark and his scouting party uh, ultimately don't find much. So he ends up coming back. Well, now. Lewis is going to head out front. It's now his turn to go up front. Again, he asks Sacagawea, what's that word? What's that word for white man? Tababone. Am I getting that correct? Make sure I am pronouncing this word correct. Tababone. Right? And okay. now me. And now me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have that. We're set, gang. Let's go. Lewis travels about 50 miles in a few days. And on August 9th, he walks about five miles where he believes they see something when he pulls out a telescope and he saw quote an Indian on horseback about two miles distance coming down on a plane towards us. His arms were in a bow and a quiver with arrows. He was mounted at an elegant horse without a saddle. Lewis then continued. I was overjoyed by the sight of the stranger and had no doubt of attaining friendly introduction to the nation I provided. And I could not near myself to convince him that we were being white men. Oh no. <laughs> Lewis heads down towards the Shoshone man, and when he gets to be about a mile uh, between each other, the Shoshone stops. Lewis does the same and try, and he puts down his gun, and he tries to walk towards him as innocent as possible, probably even doing the, <laughs> I'm a friend, I love you, you love me, please don't run away from me. As soon as Lewis starts walking closer to him, he f remembers that word Sacagawea taught to Clark, and he starts repeating Tababone. Tababone? <laughs> Tababone. Me, then, Tababone. 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 <laughs> Me. Stranger. Stranger danger. Right here. He rolls up his sleeve to show that he has white skin, because keep in mind, he's been in the sun for a while, so he needs to show some uncovered skin. He has a heck of a farmer's tan, is what it sounds like. But again, what he's really saying is he's rolling up his sleeve and saying, enemy, enemy. Like <laughs> This could really take a different meaning to the Shoshone, who does what you would expect, and he runs away. Oh, no. So Lewis is horrified because the Shoshone, the man that they need to meet with, basically so they can trade horses so they can still get over those Rocky Mountains, which, by the way, uh, they're getting closer, mm, but they need to get up them pretty quick. They continue to follow the Shoshone's trail, but there's a nice little bonus because as it gets to August 12th, they're coming across the source of the Missouri River. On August 12th, Lewis wrote, at a distance of four miles further, the road took us to the most distant fountain of water of the mighty Missouri in search of what we might spend so many toilsome days and restless nights. Thus far, I had accomplished one of the great objects in which my mind had been unalterably fixed for years. Judge then of the pleasure I felt, lying my thirst in the pure cold ice water. One of the men at the expedition was quite literally able to stand over the Missouri River source, one foot on each side. This is now the moment where Lewis knew the Continental Divide was near. We're at the source of the Missouri. Again, we're going to go up this ridge, and we're going to see what we just came up. We're going to see that waterway, and it's going to be awesome. We've done it, guys. 
We're going to go meet up with the Shoshone, get our horses, and we're going to continue going down the water route. Lewis starts excitedly walking up this ridge, and you can almost picture nature whispering in his ear. He's getting so excited. Come up me. See what's over this ridge. He gets closer. He gets closer to the ridge. He's at the top. And as he peeks over, he can hear nature saying, ha, <laughs> you're not even close to the Rocky Mountains. And there's not even a waterway. You're boned, buddy. There is no Northwest Passage. <laughs> All this was a lie. None of it exists. Oh, no. If you thought Lewis was disappointed before, he now has to envision a future where he has to tell Thomas Jefferson that there's no all-water route to the Pacific. That dream is quite literally dead now. And just like that, hopes and dreams dashed. It, with one little peek over the ridge. Oh, by the way, they don't have their horses yet from the Shoshone, which now those horses take a much more important role. <laughs> They need them to go the rest of the way. <laughs> they need a lot of ponies right away. So disappointed. You kind of get the the feeling that Lewis was, um, you know, that Charlie Brown walk where his head is completely down. Yeah. Imagine that, but he's walking really fast because he knows that he's on the clock here. So he's, he's doing the Charlie Brown walk, but really fast. He travels for a couple days and they're trying to find the tribe. When finally, Lewis again sees two women and a man. Again, what's that word Sacagawea told me? Oh, Tababone. Tababone? Tababone. And the old women and the children just sit there. They are part of the Lemhi Shoshone. The, the Lemhi Shoshone had been horribly picked on by the neighboring tribes. Oh, no. As in, every time somebody went on a raid, it was almost like taking candy from a baby. That was these people. And if you remember uh, from a couple minutes ago, this is also the same tribe uh, Sacagawea was taken from. It was well known. This was a pushover tribe. They're not in good standing, or they're not at good strength. Now, instead of running away, they just freeze there. And when they get to Lewis... They think he is actually part of the Blackfeet, which the Blackfeet tribe, we'll get into it probably next episode. The Blackfeet are the power. Just as the Sioux are the power on the plains, the Blackfeet are the power in this area. They believe Lewis is in league with them, and he's going to lead a war party. That is their initial thought. They're not thinking, this person we don't know might be a friend. They're trained to think, we're going to die. This is the end. They see a stranger fight. They're not even like, did you just say fight or flight? No. Oh, I said fight, but no, they're pushovers. So they're expecting to die. <laughs> yeah. They're just expecting, well, this is, this is probably it. So the women and men just bow their heads as if they're about to die. After a lot of convincing, Lewis is able to be shown the tribe. There he's actually been brought back to the camp. They don't want to really bring him but they're going to allow him. But he's done enough convincing that they actually meet the chief, whose name is Kameoate. And he comes up to them with open arms because he does believe they're not with the Blackfeet. Maybe, just maybe, fortune is with the Shoshone at this point. He keeps repeating the phrase, Aie, which means, I am pleased, or I am much rejoiced. He then put his arm over Lewis and applied his left cheek to Lewis's right cheek and repeated the phrase. The Shoshone again anticipated the Blackfeet war party was in the area. And this is why the young warrior that Lewis saw a couple days before, that's why he ran. So Lewis is given something to eat. And as he's meeting, as he's talking with Kamehameha, he's given information that makes Lewis believe the Columbia may actually be a tributary to the Pacific river, which means that river is much longer than Lewis anticipated. And if that's true, their travel just got a little bit easier. He then also tells, Kamehameha also tells Lewis that the Nez Perce will likely be the next tribe that they encounter, but they're going to have to go over the mountains. And when Lewis asks, well, how is it passing the mountains? Kamehameha says, well, it's really tough. And when Lewis says, how tough? 
Kameo Wait does the shoulder shrug like, I don't know, but the Nest Purse are able to do it, so there must be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but there's a way. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you asking me? Do you see how big those things are? We're not going up there. Are you crazy? Do you see why we're here? Like, we literally have a, 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 a village right here. What are you talking about? Asking about the mountains. We're not stupid. Why would we go up there? What are you, some type of fool? But despite the news, Lewis needs to play this situation perfectly because he still needs those horses real bad. Not only does he still need to remove any suspicion that he is with a rival tribe, uh, he needs to wait until Clark and a much bigger group of men are there. So he has to put on his acting shoes. Now, Clark is only making four or five miles a day in order to catch up. But Lewis is able to send plans to Clark uh, to let him know that the... uh, to let him know that the Shoshone and their suspicions and like, Hey, maybe let's play this cool. When you get up here, like, I don't maybe have like some of those Valentine's day hearts and like, right. just have well, a they have second to we though. So, I mean, they will get to be able to that. They do. What an excellent, excellent segue because as they're coming up, Sacagawea with a young woman, with a child, was the perfect thing to convince the Shoshone that they were a friend because you're not going to take a woman and a child on a war party. Right. Uh, It makes sense now. Yeah. She is quite literally the best thing they could have taken. Now, is she going to stay in with them? Like, is she going to go back and stay with them? No, she is... now, they say she is Charbonneau's wife, but let's be honest, it's more property at this point. Why would a 16-year-old want to be with a 45-year-old? Yeah. Right. So, yes, a husband, but that's in quotes. But now they can continue their, their pattern of translation. Do you remember the translation? Tabino? The chain? Yeah, the domino. Sacagawea would be able to speak Shoshone Hiradatsa. She would then give that to Charbonneau, who would speak it into French, who would give it to, I believe, Drouillard, who would then pass it on to the Americans. Now, the ultimate, the the big moment of this season is happening because the, the negotiations are starting. And just as they get started, Sacagawea burst into tears. <gasps> oh no. She burst into tears because she realized Kamehawit was her brother. No. Negotiations just got a whole lot easier. <laughs> I will give you, you whatever you want, sister. It is the most fortunate coincidence. I won't say in American history, because that's that's speaking it, but in a news full of bad in a season full of bad news, for that to happen is dang near a miracle. Because now the expedition is gonna get exactly what it wants, because they just had a family reunion when both of them believed that they wouldn't meet each other ever again. Sakajui and Kameo Wait. So, negotiations go swell. They got their horses. They've done it. Woohoo! Lewis takes up to his journal on August 18th. And we haven't talked about it much during this episode, but in the last episode we talked about he may have had, may have had, he was, he suffered from depression. There is only a couple times where you can cite his depression on the expedition. This is a journal entry that everyone kind of goes back to. On August 18th, again, remember, Lewis just traded a a triumph. Like, this was a big moment. He has the horses. They have a chance. They have a fighting chance to get past the mountains. He's taken his men about 2,000 miles at this point, and only one of them has died, and it was nothing he could do about it, right? That was something completely out of their control. Completely out of their control. Lewis writes in his journal, quote, This day I have completed my 31st year. 
I reflected that I have done but little, very little indeed, but very little indeed. No further the happiness of the human race or advance the information of the succeeding generation. I viewed with regret for many hours I have spent in indolence, and now I solely feel the want that information for those these hours could have been given had had my had judiciously expended. He believes he hasn't done enough in life. At Man. thirty-one. So it was his birthday that he wrote that. Yes. Which makes you think. Now I'm I'm lucky enough. I've never, um, I've never suffered from depression. But if Meriwether Lewis is saying this, and he's saying, "What have I done with my life?" I think. Everyone just needs to give themselves a little bit more credit of where they're at in life. Like you have accomplished much more than you think you have. I mean, he just needed to look around like he was seeing stuff that no one, no American had seen before. He was charting. He was writing. He was accomplishing so much. Right. If you think of it, he had... Again, he just succeeded this the negotiation for the tri- for the horses, but he had delivered Sacagawea's child. He had brought his men again two thousand miles, and one person has died so far. Like that's incredible. I couldn't go a week outside without dying, and he's taken nearly three dozen men out into the wild, and he's succeeding but he doesn't see it. I think that's a lot of people's thinking though. Like they only look at their failures, not at what right. their successes are. In which case, I mean, what it really comes down to is, I mean, it, it's not really ever said, but like Lewis will never marry. And I think that really um, good hits him hard. Now that's going to be more on the, the next episode, but I think he focuses so much on what he hadn't done, like you were saying, that he's so blind to what he has accomplished. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think when you focus so much on what you want, like everything else that happens that's awesome, like you don't think about because you're solely focused on what you want. Right. So that I'm assuming that's what he was thinking. Yep. But I mean, it's just weird because you even read a, like a, a different passage of him being like, I had solely focused on this moment and I was able to like drink the ice cold water. Yeah. Yeah. Like, can you imagine like wanting something and then all of a sudden being like, holy crap, it's here. <laughs> like, this is what I've been prepping for for how many years? Since 1803. Yeah. Sitting with Jefferson. Yeah. Can you imagine how many times he had played that conversation in his head of telling Jefferson, and then we saw the Northwest Passage, and it was great, and this is what the weather was like, and this is how I felt, and this is what we did. You should have been there, but you weren't, because I was. <laughs> I was. I accomplished it. And then it doesn't exist. So, mm-hmm. crap. Now this conversation needs to go completely different. So imagine telling your boss that thing you were really excited about uh doesn't exist right no i'll be heartbreaking sorry (laughs) so i think we're gonna leave it there for now that was part two i really like lewis and clark i hope these are uh these are coming off good but i'm having a lot of fun recording this one so hopefully hopefully everyone else is enjoying that because i'm nerding out real bad right now (laughs) make sure to tune in next week when we conclude Mr. Meriwether Lewis. Remember, if you like what you heard today, go ahead and like and subscribe. Leave us a comment on whatever podcast service you are listening on. Uh, We really appreciate it. And you can always check out our website, ranking76.wordpress.com, where you will find a link to all of our social media, our email. You can see the scorecards. You can check out the other episodes you may have missed. Um, We really appreciate it. And with that, I am Eric. And I'm Matt. Ciao bella. Ciao bella. Italian. Tababone. Tababone. <laughs>
Tababone. <laughs> and until next time, Tababone. <laughs>